Okay, so welcome back. So I guess I want to start by pointing you towards what I believe to be a fairly significant trend that is burning away in the background of, of society, a trend that I, I think will have some pretty serious implications for not just running, but also the fitness and wellness industries and, and more broadly, all of healthcare. So I'm talking, of course, about, about wearable technologies, the topic of of discussion in week eight for the module. Now, many thought when wearables were first released and started going mainstream, probably back in 2009 with the release of the Fitbit Classic, many thought that they were just a flash in the pan, a technology that might appeal to a certain cultural niche, people interested in data, self-logging, self-tracking, and, and devout fitness enthusiasts. But uptake um, was only ever going to be restricted to those very specific and small groups. They thought that wearable tech might just be a fad, basically. And initially, that was proving to be true. These devices were a bit weird, they were a bit clunky, they were a bit nerdy, a bit niche. The tech hadn't quite caught up with its, with its own promises, let's say, and they didn't offer enough for most people. Like, why would I, for example, want to count my steps or log when I fall asleep or woke up? The functionalities being offered at the time were, were pretty limited. But then companies like Apple got in on the act. Smartwatches became a thing. And over the course of about five years, you could buy a device that you could use to read and answer messages. You could make calls. You could listen to music. You could record voice notes. You could start timers and stopwatches. And, and loads of other things. And all of this with, with a device that could now also log different workout types, estimate the number of calories you burned, give you your sleep score, you know, the amount of time that you were spending in, in non-REM or REM sleep, and alert you if you if you had an irregular heart rhythm. So when the first Apple Watch came out, I remember thinking how weird this square pebble looked on, on the few people's wrists I saw it on. But in the same way that AirPods quickly became a fashion statement and then just completely normal, so too did the Apple Watch. To the point now where you wouldn't look twice if you saw someone wearing one. They're really, really common. And this increasing penetration of wearable tech among the population plays out in the data. So every couple of years, Sport Ireland worked with Ipsos, a, a global market research and consulting firm, to conduct a large population study in order to uncover trends in participation in sport and physical activity in Ireland. Now, this isn't just about athletes. It sets a broad definition of sport and measures participation in both active and social contexts. So it includes things like club membership, volunteering, um, attendance at sport events. And it also measures other forms of physical activity like recreational walking, as well as walking and cycling for transport. Now the report is massive um, and it covers a lot of different topic areas, but the last report published in 2021 had a section on wearable technologies, the first of its kind to do this in such a large scale um, Irish context. So of the eight and a half thousand participants overall, 54% owned some kind of wearable technology. And what was most interesting here, and what I think shows the growth of this trend, is that the use of wearables nearly doubled from the previous 2017 survey, where 28% of people said they owned some kind of wearable device. And this is reflected in the latest ownership statistics for a bunch of different countries based on research conducted by, by our group here in UCD. So in the US, 40% of people own a wearable, and in Europe, right, rates are a little bit higher. In Germany, the figure is 42%. In Sweden, it's 45%. In the UK, it's 53%. And then here in Ireland, it's closer to 60% now, a substantial increase over the earlier data from, from Sport Ireland. So wearables are now being adopted as quickly as mobile phones were in the late 2000s. Um, and in 15 years' time, they may be just as commonplace. You know, maybe the two will mold together. Who knows? But in any case, what was a bit of a niche has become mainstream. 
And I guess not only are wearables here to say, they're kind of playing a bigger and bigger role in, in all aspects of our lives. But the question is whether this will be for better or, or worse. Now, as you'll know, we actually conducted a similar survey trying to update the statistics to figure out how the, the proportions of people who own a wearable and then to kind of drill down into what they use their devices for. So in this survey, we also wanted to figure out more about those who didn't own one, like why not? And also those who used to own one, but stopped using it. Now, our survey only has 14 100 responses so far. So it's not as big as the ISM one, but as I said, the data on wearables is a bit more granular. It's a bit more detailed. Now, if you hadn't noticed, I put the survey in Brightspace um, for you to do if, if you want. So I'm sure already a few of you have done it and you already know about it. So bearing that in mind, what, what did we find? Well, 71% of people reported currently owning a wearable device with over 90% having used the device for over one year. Um, and the following being the three most popular devices. You had Apple Watches, um, Fitbits, and Garments. Now, the latest statistics aren't actually displayed on screen. By far the most popular device now is the Apple Watch. But these three companies, Fitbit, Garmin, and Apple, made up 86% of the share of the devices that people owned. Now, why do people pick these devices? The main reasons cited were because it was a respectable brand and because they were already sort of in the ecosystem. That was actually particularly relevant for the Apple Watch, which you can't use unless you have an iPhone. But if you're in that Apple ecosystem, the watch fits nicely in. And that was important for a lot of the Apple people. But other than those two things, nothing really stuck out. People bought their devices for lots of different reasons. For workout tracking, because it had GPS, because it looked nice, because it was easy to use, because you could play music on it, and loads of other things. When it came to health and sports-specific stuff that people used most, again, nothing really stuck out except for step counting and heart rate. Here, people were asked to rank you know, how frequently they used certain features. All you really need to know is that the purple bars represent everyday use with the blue bars at the top, essentially meaning never, never using them. The green bars mean that the respondent's device doesn't actually measure that variable. So people were probably most interested in steps and heart rate because most devices on the market measure those two things. They're kind of staple metrics. But beyond those two, most people, um, most people do use the other health tracking features, but they are interested in lots of different ones. So sleep tracking, energy expenditure, GPS-based speed and distance, maximum heart rate, uh, resting heart rate, and lots more. So why is all of this relevant for us in this module? Well, during the last live lecture, I talked about some pretty interesting insights, for me at least, that, that could be gleaned from um, crowdsourcing wearable data. Remember how I talked about the New York Times analysis of race data that was captured from about 500,000 marathoners and half marathoners who wore wearables. Now, as a recap, using public race reports and shoe records from Strava, the Times were able to uncover that runners who wore Nike's new shoe, sorry, super shoes, the Vaporflies, they ran about three to 4% faster than similar runners wearing other shoes. The size of their data set meant that they could sanity check their own results using four different analysis approaches, which showed that the difference was not explained by faster runners choosing to wear the shoes, by runners choosing to wear them in easier races, or by runners switching to the vapor of flies after running more training miles. Instead, their analysis, which wouldn't have been possible without wearables and citizen science, let's say, showed that in a race between two marathoners with the same ability, a runner wearing vapor flies would have a real advantage over a competitor not wearing them. And this is what wearables might be able to offer. Population level insights that advance our understanding of human health and performance, and not just about marathon performance. If you think about it, let's say two thirds of the population use a wearable, and let's say that number increases to about 75% over the next 10 years. Let's say those 20, 30, and 40-year-olds continue to wear those devices or continue to buy new devices for the next 10, 20, or 30 years. Think about all the data that's being captured and what insights might be gleaned from it. 
we're not just talking about a couple of marathons. This is 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years at a time. Think about all the times you've been sick in your life. Think about how elderly people become frail, how they lose their strength and independence. Um, think about the link between behaviors, sleep, physical activity, social isolation, and mental health. Think about all the biometric data that would typically be monitored if you went for a checkup with your GP or what would be measured if you got really sick and had to stay as an inpatient in a hospital for a few weeks. What wearables might offer is a lifetime worth of normative data for each individual person, a kind of biometric fingerprint that could be leveraged to give you a snapshot of your current health, that could alert you if the behaviors you're engaging in or not engaging in, for example, exercise, how that might put you at an increased risk of disease or could be used to monitor your recovery after disease. What if wearables offered a way to roll out public health initiatives, simple things like hand washing after you go to the bathroom, avoiding loud noises to protect your hearing, or increasing your physical activity levels just a little bit? So whether you use all of its features or pay attention to the biometric measures that your wearable device is capturing every minute of every day, it's, it's capturing that data regardless. And whether you like it or not, companies like Apple, Fitbit, and, and therefore Google, and Garmin, and Whoop, and Samsung are building up biometric profiles for their users. And we've already seen how these companies are gaining insights, however basic they might seem, into population level behavior and, and health. Here's an example. So Fitbit have this measure called active zone minutes, which is basically just how much time you spend in different um, heart rate zones throughout the day. So they took a bunch of their users who met the American Heart Association's recommended physical activity target of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity in February, 2022, but not in the previous month, so January, 2022. And then they assessed whether they saw corresponding improvements in their health, really simple. The results showed how meeting those intensity targets was associated with positive health impacts across things like heart rate, sorry, resting heart rate, heart rate variability, sleep and stress management scores. Basically, those who exercised more had better heart rate variability, they slept better and they had lower stress. And then during COVID, Fitbit found that daily step counts decreased by as much as 38% in certain global regions in response to pandemic lockdowns, which could have a pretty profound impact on population health. So you see what insights can be gained, or put another way, what these companies know about their users by even a basic analysis of, of heart rate and activity. That could have a lot of power for public good, but it's also slightly alarming how much these companies might know about you considering that it's your private data. And if you look at the small print in these companies' privacy policies I, I have, they are sharing lots of your personal data with third parties, probably to sell you more stuff. Whoop in particular are, are very bad for this. So there's a pos possible um, dystopian end point that many people have highlighted with all of this remote data capture. What if companies like Apple, Google, Garmin and Whoop one day decided to change their privacy policies. Actually, Whoop wouldn't even have to change their privacy policy. They could theoretically do this now and sell your data to, for example, insurance companies. What if they knew that there was some biometric marker, say an excess of drinking in your 20s or a lack of sleep in your 30s or low levels of physical activities in, in your 40s that had some level of prediction accuracy to say that you were likely to fall ill? Not now but in 10, 20, or 30 years' time. Imagine then that the insurance companies profile you and increase your premium because you are deemed high risk. What if those same insurance companies ask you to submit your wearable biometric data as a prerequisite for a quote and find that there is some red flag, which they don't tell you about, that results in you being classified as higher risk, your premiums going up, and then you're in no position to do anything about it. We already know that certain things like lower limb strength or walking speed or the distance you travel in six minutes of walking are predictive of falls and mortality in the elderly. The latter two things 
can be pretty reliably estimated with most commercially available devices today. So this is not beyond the realms of possibility. What you're seeing on screen there is, well, I guess my six minute walk test score. And that's in this example, 500 meters. So the utopian antithesis of this is a situation where you own your own data and the knowledge of your own level of risk and you're alerted about this and how to remedy the situation, a kind of remotely monitored and implemented prophylaxis. Which of these utopian or dystopian worlds come to pass is dependent on two things. First, we need to know what can be measured, and then we need to know what is worth measuring. So the first question, what can be measured? So far, I've kind of um, taken it as a given that the physiological data that wearable devices they they measure can actually be measured with any degree of accuracy. We talked about the Strava data set and what insights could be gleaned from wearable tech. But to be fair, all the analysts at the New York Times really needed to know was the runner's finish times and what shoes they were wearing. So that's pretty basic. Health is different. If you're going to be making predictions or remotely monitoring patients, you need to know that you are measuring what you think you are measuring and that you can measure it consistently over time. So this is what's known as the validity and reliability of your measurement tool, which basically combine to determine how accurate it is. I talked about this in the video lecture, but let's look at an example in a running context. So remember VO2 max. VO2 max or maximal op uh, sorry, oxygen uptake is the greatest amount of oxygen that can be used by the entire body, and it's related to the ability of the heart and lungs to transport oxygen and the ability of the body tissues to use it. So this is one of the most interesting variables to runners because it's a great indicator of your overall performance level, and it can be used to predict how fast you complete certain races and lots of running watches estimate VO2 max. So the Garmin Forerunner devices do it, the Apple Watch does it, most Fitbit devices do it as well. Anything with GPS and heart rate probably does it. So VO2 max is normally measured in a laboratory setting through a maximal test. I'll just go back so that we can see it during this test. So that video, the video from which this is taken is, is in, in the week three learning units for the module. Now, obviously, wearables don't have the capacity to replicate that test. So they use algorithms to predict what a person's VO2 max is. The inputs in these algorithms is usually, as I said, some combination of heart rate and running speed that's derived from GPS. But both of those inputs are prone to error themselves. So it's not really a surprise then that so too are the VO2 max predictions. It depends on what algorithm is being used, but the error can be up to 5%. And it also depends on whether, for instance, you're wearing a heart rate monitor as well as, as, as the device. So that level of error, let's say it's 5%, that accuracy is an important thing to keep in mind when thinking about what can be measured by wearable tech. You see, despite its popularity, research is pretty equivocal about whether consumer wearable devices can actually measure biometric data like heart rate and energy expenditure and steps and sleep and stress, just to name a few. A review of consumer wearables in 2018 found that less than half of devices on the market had been validated through independent research with only 5% of technologies undergoing formal validation. And this review was published in 2018. We have a review under review at the moment that, that updates this. So it includes over 400 studies looking at the validity of wearable devices. It's not published yet, but it will be soon, hopefully. But the issue is that companies selling these products tend to deliver well-crafted pitches about how their product is an essential tool for essentially everything. That's that's the Apple slogan there. I, I, I say that with no degree of irony, considering I'm wearing the device that's being advertised. Anyway, the idea is that it's empowering users to take the next steps in reaching new heights in fitness and performance. But they generally fail to back, back up their, their claims with large, longitudinal, and independently gathered, openly accessible data sets. So this is true of wearable biosensors for monitoring training loads, movement patterns, injury risk, psychological stress, or that claim to promote better sleep or be, B 
be the coach on your wrist telling you about your readiness to train or your body battery. So many of you will know that we're doing a class experiment investigating the accuracy of different wearables right now. So basically we're getting people to either come to the lab and do a VO2 max test or in a separate study, getting people to submit their sleep and readiness scores from their device each morning and to complete a questionnaire that has been validated for the use of measuring sleep quality and training readiness. This is something that wearable technology technology companies don't have right now, a system of annotation, a way to sanity check the results. So sure, they know how long you slept for last night or that your resting heart rate increased over the last week, but they often don't know why. It might have been because you were out late and on the drink or you might have been, you know, you might have had an early training session to attend. You might have a young child to look after or, or your apartment might be loud and not conducive to you getting a good night's sleep. That's what the tech giants and the wearable tech companies are missing, context. It's like the New York Times trying to estimate the effect of the vapor flies, but not knowing anything about the runners' training patterns, what the weather was like during the race or what the course was like. Context is, is really important. And that's why for our class exercise, we're using questionnaires, things like the Sated questionnaire for sleep and the Profile and Mood States questionnaire to capture mood and the Borg scale to measure perceived exertion. All of these things, they provide us with either a reference standard according to which we can compare our readiness and body battery scores or also the context to those scores, something that wearable tech companies don't have, although they are working on it. So we know that body battery and training readiness are probably being calculated based on things like heart rate variability, sleep, resting heart rate, and any activities you did in the last 24 hours along with how intense they were. This based on what the companies tell us about how they calculate these things, but do they actually reflect self-report measures of mood, sleep, and, and wellness? To find out, those who are participating in the class exercise very generously are completing a questionnaire every morning that captures things like their mood with what's known as that profile of mood states questionnaire, how they slept, their performance level, their stress, whether they were sick or injured, and what their energy levels are like. So these latter variables are often captured in sports settings as a way to manage training load. So for if, you're, if your performance level is deemed to be low or if you have a high degree of soreness, your coach can use this information to modify your training session. But in reality, there is actually no valid way to measure them. Teams just use a five item Likert survey. For example, you're either very sore or you're feeling great. Anyway, what you'd expect to see is some relationship between body battery and training readiness and mood or those self-report measures. But what we actually see is essentially no relationship, no correlation between them. And this means that of those who completed the daily questionnaires, they first put in how they felt on the questionnaires and then submitted data from their wearable, but there was no consistent relationship between those two things. You might have thought you slept great or that you were ready to go for training or a match, but your wearables feedback would often contradict this. So how many times have you slept poorly, but your wearable has told you that your sleep score was great? This is what's going on here. There still seems to be a mismatch between perception and what your wearable says. So as you can see, the, the idea of what you can actually measure with wearables is not as simple as it seems. Even for more mainstream variables, things like steps, heart rate, and energy expenditure, there are, there's a lot of variation in accuracy between devices with error margins up to 25%. So what's the result? Well, right now, we consumers essentially ship the bill to basically beta test these products, surrendering our personal data to companies who can then iterate and refine their proprietary algorithms to eventually maybe fulfill the promises they're making about current products in future ones. And, and what, what does the academic, what can the academic community done to solve this problem? Not much. Okay. We really haven't. The problem is that it takes so long to do a study figuring out the best methodology, submitting it for ethical approval, recruiting participants, analyzing results, identifying a target journal, drafting a report, submitting it for peer review, and then proceeding through the response revised cycle. All of this takes a really long time and it cannot keep up with the commercial ecosystem in which companies release new hardware 
on an annual cycle and push software updates several times in a single year. So what do we do? Well, one of the other insights gleaned from the results of the surveys that consumers don't really look to academic journals to inform their purchasing decisions. Instead, they go to Google, which itself relays users to a vast network of information resources, all of which are ranked according to the highest bidder. So this means that people are buying devices based on influencers' recommendations, which is problematic because these influencers generally make claims about accuracy based on an analysis of their own data. That's like doing an experiment on one person. The results can't be generalized to the wider population. Just because a device can accurately measure heart rate in a 20-year-old white male doesn't mean it's accurate for a 60-year-old black female. If we were to just consider skin tone, we know these devices use photoplethysmography, light shone through the skin into the blood vessel to measure the pulse of blood flow. But we also know that the skin tone affects this. So the results for these two example subjects are likely not going to be the same. And this applies across measures with each. We, we each of us sleep differently. We walk differently. We respond to exercise differently. We manifest stress differently. And all of this can catch out the company's algorithms, which were invariably developed in a small subset of people. The other problem is that these influencers often have a conflict of interest. The companies won't sponsor their videos or give them early access to products if they have a tendency to give unfavorable reviews. So we're in a, 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 a no-win situation where the companies um, operate in an ecosystem that they themselves have created, where they control the narrative about how good they're dealing, doing in terms of population health um, and how great their, their products are. And while... I, I, would, I wouldn't say strides, while improvements are being made, they are also the gatekeepers to their users' own data. And that's potentially a ticking time bomb for that dystopian future I mentioned before. So this is actually something that our research group is working on. It's developing a citizen science platform to develop and house wearable data. It's called Cerberus, that's the name of the project. And it's you know, after a three-headed dog that guards the underworld. And it consists of a, a validation head, which, which will test how accurate wearables are for measuring things like heart rate, blood pressure, body fat percentage, and, and heart rate variability. Then you have a synthesis head, which will summarize and centralize all the available research on wearables. And then a user experience head, which will involve developing a data donation platform for wearable devices, um, where the data is, is devoted for scientific purposes and anonymized. So we're also going to be engaging with healthcare professionals and researchers under this under this head to figure out a way to better use wearable data and open up the ecosystem where companies are, are the gatekeepers to their own, to users' own data. Like I said, through that donation platform. So um, this is this is a long-term project. We're still in its early stages, but keep an eye out for us though. And that's our website, www.wearablewatchdoc.com. So a bit of a plug for our research. Um, and we'll be uploading videos to the same YouTube channel that I've used to share your lectures on for, let's say, the equivalent of, of product reviews. So that's it for today. That's our last live lecture. Just to note, before I turn off the recording and get questions from you, your exam is going to be on the 26th of April at half five. And yeah, please submit feedback. I think we're at about 6% rate at the moment. And... This is only the second year that this module is run, and it, it would be really helpful if you could submit feedback. Thank you. So I'm going to stop the recording now, just a second.